We appreciate it. Mr. Obelnolte, the gentleman yields back. Mr. Obelnolte, please recognize you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm delighted I get an opportunity to ask a second round of questions because, Dr. Crawford, I had one for you. Uh, I, I found your testimony very meaningful, and you said something that I found profound, enough so that I made a note of it. You said, we have treatment, and treatment works. Uh, but I think it's important that we're very frank on this issue because I might respectfully push back a little bit on that. I'm not sure I agree. I, I would say we have treatment and sometimes it works. Uh, one recurring theme in people that lose their lives to addiction is that they quite often have been in and out of treatment their entire lives. That's certainly been true in my own extended family where I have people that I love that have been in and out of treatment programs uh, and just cannot seem to get the problem solved. Uh, Mr. Straley I mean, gave some very incredibly emotional testimony about his daughter who, the same thing, in and out of treatment programs until she lost her life. So it seems to me when someone comes into treatment and says, I've had enough, I need help, uh, I want this to be over, I'll do anything, uh, let's go. You know, and we put them to treatment and it doesn't work. You know, we've, we've missed that opportunity. What can we do to reduce, you know, that cycle of in and out of treatment? What can we do to fix that problem that first time? I wish I knew the full answer to that question. Uh, what I could share, and I appreciate your comment. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, so we have treatment and treatment works um, sometimes. It's probably a good um, caveat. When I make that comment, I speak medically, and so we have no um, treatment that works 100% of the time, really, um, but it is statistically significantly an improvement over not treating, for example. Um, but yeah, so what can we do? Um, I think one of the biggest things is taking a, an approach of harm reduction, um, as we've talked about, and also um, personalized care approaches. Um, I think too often we are creating you know, a program that has a structure that we say, okay, this is how you come into it and this is how it works for everyone. And we're all unique individuals with unique life journeys. And so I think having more flexibility, uh, really truly meeting people where they're at, you know, perhaps when they engage with us, uh, we should be asking them more what's the most important thing to them instead of assuming we know and trying to prescribe it to them. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in approaches like that. Thank you, that's, that's valuable. Uh, Ms. Keller, uh, you said something in your testimony that really stuck with me also when you were talking about telehealth and the need to expand access to telehealth. Uh, for my district, telehealth has been a complete game changer, particularly during the pandemic. And uh, I actually wish we would stop calling it telehealth because I know that's the technical term for it, but I, when I talk about it, I call it virtual health because telehealth just does not encapsulate uh, the, how comprehensive our, tr our virtual treatment options are now. I mean, it's, you're not just talking to a doctor on the telephone. Most of the time, you're, you're, looking, uh, you're looking at them through video conference. Sometimes you've got uh, your own remote sensing instruments that they, or they can use to, to make diagnoses. Uh, it, it is an amazing, game-changing technology. So, uh, and, and I would say, you know, if I, following on to the discussion we've been having about uh, trying to, when someone goes into treatment, you know, trying to make it so that they get treated, that telehealth can be, oh Sarah, see I did it, uh, virtual, virtual health, virtual health could be, could be really, really instrumental in this, particularly because we can use it to treat some of the behavioral health options and epidemics uh, that, that exist in our country. So uh, my question for you is, because you, know, you are an expert in this, uh, how can we, in Congress, expand virtual health and virtual health treatment options for the people that we represent? For that, I, I agree that virtual health is, is going to be... I like where you went there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's the way of the future, especially when it comes to treatment, because you can be in an opioid treatment program in an inpatient center and still be receiving mental health treatment or, or substance use treatment or just primary care treatment, especially in rural areas where you can't access a program, <coughs> you can't drive to one or walk into one. So I think just making sure that insurance does cover it, that Medicaid covers it, and that every, every American has access to that, I think it's going to be a game changer, especially you, you described you're in a very rural area. So I would venture to guess there's a lot of your residents who just can't drive to a treatment center. Right. Yeah, well, we, there were some flexibilities granted in Medicare treatment uh, for virtual health options during the pandemic. 
I know that Congress has been working very hard to uh, to extend those flexibilities in areas where they were working, which is the vast majority of them. So uh, we're certainly going to keep up that work. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much to all of our witnesses. Really enjoyed the hearing today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman.